If you have your Bibles today, I'd ask you quickly to join me. I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. I do apologize. I took tremendous lengthy liberties at the beginning of the service today, yakking and talking. I hope somebody found some encouragement, some inspiration, something in my words earlier, but now it's time for the message that God has given me for the church at this hour. First Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse 9 and reading through verse 17. First Peter chapter 2, beginning at verse number 9 and reading through verse 17. The word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation or your behavior, your conduct, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God, in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the King. Amen. Want to talk to us today on an unusual topic. I have titled it Super Saints. Amen. Super Saints. If you bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, once again, God, it is time to go to the Word of God. It is time to hear from heaven, to receive that manna which is sent down by reason of your word to feed the hungry soul of God's people. Lord, your church, your people today are not benefited by the thoughts of men. They're not benefited by man-made doctrine or dogma. That which is able to change us, that which is able to empower us, that which is able today to equip us to be a witness and a testimony in a lost world is a word from the Lord. For it's through the word of God that healing comes, that deliverance is delivered and administered. It's through the word of God that faith is inspired in the heart of the unbeliever and that spark is lit Lord that enables them to grab hold of salvation for by grace are you saved through faith 
and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Master, in the name of Jesus, use your messenger today. Use your servant today, O God, to be a blessing, an encouragement, a help, an inspiration to the people of God. Let every word that proceeds from my lips be anointed of the Holy Ghost. And let every hearer, every hearer, receive the word of God today. O oh, Master, in the precious name of Jesus we ask it. Amen. Praise God and amen. Super saints, if you don't mind this afternoon, it's a little warm here in Alabama. I'm going to go ahead and take this jacket off. Amen. That particular jacket's kind of a little bit on the warm side. Amen. The fictional character Superman is portrayed. You'll notice I'm using him as my illustration today for my message. He's portrayed as having powers and abilities that defy natural laws. He's able to defy the law of gravity, for instance. He doesn't have to get up to speed to fly, you know. It's not like he has wings or anything like that. But somehow or another, he just, it's like the rules of this world, the natural order, the natural rules simply don't apply to him. He's able to simply float up into the air and fly and do what he needs to do. He's able to repel bullets. You know, as the old saying used to go, uh, he's able to leap tall buildings. Amen. Oh my, the rules just don't apply to him. The rules that apply to us gravity and inertia but i want to tell you today the word of god tells us that god's people are unique we are unusual we are different we are in the world still but we are not of the world we too like superman as it were oh my lord live by a different set of rules. We live by a different law. We are subject to very different mandates than those that are upon the world. As children of God, we become subject to an entirely new realm of laws and realities and powers. God's people are subject to the same struggles, the same troubles, where we experience strife associated with human existence. But because we have been born again into the family of God, we are subject to different laws. Much like the representative of a foreign nation who lives and works in another country to represent his own nation much like that one is afforded what is referred to as diplomatic immunity so too God's people are given diplomatic immunity by reason of our faith hallelujah by reason of our faith in the accomplished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary sin does not have the same power over us <coughs> that it does the unbeliever the bullets the darts the fiery darts of Satan are able to pierce the flesh of the unbeliever. They're able to destroy the soul of that one who has not embraced the gospel. But by the power of the Holy Ghost in the life <clears throat> of a born-again believer, the fiery darts of the wicked fall. Hallelujah. 
as the shield of faith stands before us. Glory to God. Oh, we live by different rules. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I remember many years ago, excuse me, I remember many years ago I was preaching a revival in a Pentecostal church of God. That is a denomination uh, separate from the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. It's another denomination that really believes pretty much the same as the Church of God, but it's a different organization. And many, many, many moons ago, I was preaching a revival in this church. And one night, the pastor's wife came up to me and she said, oh, brother, I've got to tell you something. And I said, what's that? She said, tonight as you were preaching, she said, God allowed me to see something. She said, you were up there preaching, and my God, that you were preaching, and the power of God was so powerful. She said, all of a sudden, the altars at the front of the church broke out in flames. She said, I literally saw the floor around the altars burning with fire. Now, you might think that's a bad thing, but in the spirit, in the spiritual sense, fire is a good thing. Hallelujah. That means purging. That means cleansing. That means purifying, and it means empowering. So God was showing her that we were about to have an altar service that the power of God was going to fall. And it did. And we did. And the girl I married back in the 80s, her brother received the gift of the Holy Ghost that night in that service. She said, I saw fire break out of the altars. She said, and then I saw these fiery darts. She said they were great big darts, like lawn darts, you know. She said, and they were on fire. She said, I saw them begin to shoot at you from like the congregation. She said, it, it, not from people in the congregation per se. She said, but they, they were just coming from the direction of the congregation and they were coming right at you as you were preaching. She said, and every time these darts would start to fly at you, she said, the biggest shield I've ever seen would rise up in front of you. She said, and those darts hit that shield and fell into the fire that was burning around the altars. She said, and then the shield would go down. She said, all of a sudden, those darts would start again. She said, but before they ever reached you, she said, this enormous shield, bigger than you are. She said, this shield came up, and it stood in front of you. And those darts would hit that shield, and they'd fall into the fiery altars. The Word of God said that the armor of God, the whole armor of God includes the shield of faith, which is able, it says, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Hallelujah. And God allowed her to see what is described in the Word of God in spiritual terms. He allowed her to see the shield of faith rise up in front of me. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, folks, we are super saints. Glory to God. We live by different rules. Hallelujah. You know, people love to watch the X-Men. People love to watch these movies and television programs that portray human beings with supernatural abilities and supernatural powers. Well, I've got news for you today. As a born-again, spirit-filled child of God, honey, you've got supernatural powers. You've got supernatural abilities that are available to you. I remember years ago I was in the church of God and I heard the story of uh, some missionaries folks, Pentecostal missionaries who had traveled to a very, they were trying to get to an extremely remote uh, tribe. I forget where, whether it was in New Guinea, might have been New Guinea because I knew, personally knew a United Pentecostal missionary who went to New Guinea. And um, 
He, matter of fact, he may have been the one that shared this story. But anyway, uh, and he talked about the fact that these missionaries had some people they had hired, you know, to help them get to this very remote tribe so they could bring this great message to them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they reached a river. And they were carrying supplies and they were carrying all kinds of stuff. And apparently there had been some hard rains. And this river that normally would be, you know, much less was running full. And it was, it was deep and it was wide. And there was a lot of water. And they had no way to cross this river. Jesus said, greater works than these shall they do which come after me. Because I go unto the Father. He said, once I leave this world, I'm going to return by reason of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to return by reason of my spirit. And my people are going to be able to do things even I didn't do while I was here. Well, those missionaries, they looked at that river. They said, well, how in the world are we going to get across this? And the people who were bringing them explained to them, it would take weeks before this river would go down enough where you could walk across it. And they said, well, then we're just going to have to go to God. And they began to pray. They said, Lord, you said greater works than these shall they do which come after me. I said, Lord, you walked on the water. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus was a superman. Hallelujah. He did things that defied the laws of nature, didn't he? Walked on water. They said, Lord, you walked on water. Well, right now, we need the ability to walk on water. And, look, and they said that they literally, as they were praying, they took hands and they they were trying to hold their materials and stuff, and they stepped into the water and they began to walk. And they literally walked across that river. <laughs> and they said that their feet barely got wet. And they reached the other side. I'm going to tell you something. When they got to that tribe they were going to, that tribe was utterly shocked that these people had reached them and had no way of transversing that river and that miracle that God had given them served as a testimony to this native people that their God was the true God and a real God Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people under the sound of my voice you listen to a story like that and you say, oh that's a crock of nonsense that's a bunch of baloney. Um, oh, honey, I'll tell you what. I have known personally. I've experienced things personally. God has brought me through things personally that has staggered the mind and the imagination of scientists and doctors way back in 1989. Without going into great detail, I, I overdosed. I took too much Tylenol, way too much Tylenol. And not knowing that Tylenol, uh, acetaminophen, can have an extremely detrimental effect on your liver. Well, I wound up sick as a mule. My, uh, grand I was at my grandparents' house and I was taken by ambulance to the hospital and the doctors were trying to help me and they told my family it looks like he's going to die because he has completely destroyed his liver. This Tylenol, we can't purge it, we can't clear it out of this system, it's been in there too long, there's nothing we can do. My skin turned yellow, I became jaundiced. And one day the doctor came in to talk to me and he and I were talking and I was in so much pain. My, my belly was distended and my, my liver was obviously in a lot of pain. And I was in agonizing pain. And they couldn't give me pain medication because pain medication had to be processed how? Through your liver. So they couldn't give me pain medication. So I just had to sit there and suffer and suffer and suffer. 
And oh, it was painful. And if the doctor came in, I'll never forget it. As long as I live, I'll never forget it. And we were talking and finally he looked at me and he said, we can't even figure out how in God's green earth you're still alive. And that's how he said it. He was just <laughs> really, you know, flabbergasted. He said, we can't even figure out how you're still alive. He said, I don't know how in the name of God you can even talk to me right now. He said, you should be dead as a doorknob. I don't that I'm sorry, doctor. And I, you know me, anybody who knows me knows, when I'm in the pulpit, I'm serious as, you know, a judge. But when I'm out of the pulpit, I like to cut up and tease and be lighthearted. So if some of y'all would come to church and get to know me, I think you'll find out that I take my pulpit business very seriously. But once I'm out of the pulpit, I like to, you know, have a good time and laugh. So I said something trying to be humorous, you know, and he said, Honestly, Charles, I'm not kidding you. And he went and he took my chart. This is back in the day when they still used to put a paper chart at the bottom of the bed, you know, back in 1989. And he carried this chart to me and he, he looked for a page and he said, look at this. He said, this page, he said, you see this list of things now. I've had a lot of blood work since then, and I've seen this same list now many times since then. But back then, I didn't know what it was. He said, do you see this list of things? I said, yes. He said, do you see this column right here? I said, yes. He said, this column, in the first column shows your number. The second column shows normal range. He said, look at your number and look at the normal. My number, I, I can't remember uh, how they all played out at the time. This has been many years ago now. But literally it was like my number was, say, 400. And normal was 30. My number was 200 and normal was 12. My number was 500 and normal was 35. And he went down the entire, every single thing was so out of whack. Every single bit of my blood work. He said, do you see this? Do you see what I'm showing you? I said, yes. He said, literally, this is what he said to me, doctor. I, I remember it just like it was yesterday. He said, if I took a vial of blood out of your body right now and injected it into an elephant, that elephant would drop dead to the ground. He said, I have no clue in the world how you're still living. So you know what? You doubt God all you want to. You doubt the reality of my God all you want to. You can think the stories and the anecdotes that I share are just below me and they're fake and they're fraudulent. You can think whatever you want to think. Honey, I've lived this. I sat there. I listened to the doctor tell me this. I had three doctors from one of the premier medical teaching colleges in the world come to see me in that hospital because they told me, they said, you defy every single medical book that has ever been written. They told me from Yale New Haven Hospital, part of Yale University. And they came to that little small town hospital where I was at in Derby, Connecticut. And they told me, they said, you defy everything science tells us. You defy everything that the medical books say. You know why? Oh, hallelujah. Because we're super saints. Glory to God. We live by a different set of rules. Glory. We're under a different set of laws. We have diplomatic community. Glory to God. Oh, I want to tell you, the word of God said, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And forget not all his 
benefits, who forgiveth all thy sins, who healeth all thy diseases, who delivereth thy life from destruction, who delivereth thy life from destruction, who delivereth thy life from destruction. I'm here to tell you, God has delivered this boy. He has delivered this life from destruction on far more than one occasion. Why? Because as a child of God, we have diplomatic community. We're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We're a peculiar people. That doesn't mean we're weird or we're strange. It means we're unique and unusual. When you say something is peculiar, it means that it is unusual. It is something you don't find everywhere. Oh, my Lord, have mercy that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of there. Oh, I want to tell you, God's people are constantly, many times we experience the blessing of God. Many times we experience the grace of God, the intervention of God. Many times we experience uh, God's protection and him looking out for us, and we don't even know it. We won't know it till we get to heaven. I've told the story before many years ago. I was doing my internship in the Church of God out of uh, the New Haven, Connecticut area. And uh, the pastor had called a special prayer meeting, an all-night prayer meeting at the church. I love those all-night prayer meetings. We lock ourselves into the church as many people from the churches wanted to participate. And we literally lock ourselves up in the church and we're on our knees praying throughout the entire night into the morning, into the next day, and we pray. That's when you really meet business with God and you're really trying to touch the Lord for something. We're going to have an all-night prayer meeting. I was working as the manager in a local convenience store Cumberland Farms, for those of you maybe in Florida and New England who are familiar with the Cumberland Farms uh, company, I was working for Cumberland Farms, <clears throat> and I was, it, it snowed, we had a, this is in Connecticut, we had a real good snow, the roads were covered, there was a lot of ice and snow, and I wanted to get to that prayer meeting, and I was driving my little Ford, um, uh, can't think of what you call it, a small, the small model. Escort? Escort, yes. This is back, my, the model I was driving was a 1983 and it was new. <laughs> so that tells you how far back we're looking, okay? And I'm driving my little Ford Escort and I had a standard shift uh, Ford Escort, four speed or whatever it was. And I'm driving and I had to get off this exit after I left work. I had to get off this exit and it was one of those exits that you come off the highway and it makes basically a complete circle and you wind up going when you get off the exit you wind up going the opposite direction that you were coming on the highway and that exit made a complete great big circle well as I hit the exit all of a sudden my car just lost control I lost control of my car and the car began to spin in circles literally as it is going down this exit. And I literally would feel, it was the strangest, I'm spinning like this. And the car would go up close to the guardrail, and all of a sudden I would feel it budge and it would go in the other direction a little bit. It's still spinning, but it would go in the other direction and then it would budge before it hit the other guardrail. And it kept spinning in circles and it would get close to the guardrail and it, would, it was like something was budging it, something was pushing it. And all of a sudden I got to the bottom of the exit where it met the road and I was facing upward like I was going to drive up the exit. I, you can imagine I was shaking. Scared the life out of me. I don't know how in the world I didn't hit 
those guardrails. I don't know how in the world I didn't wind up with a car that flipped over and, you know, I could have been seriously hurt. This is long before airbags and all this kind of stuff. Back in those days, people uh, were killed in car wrecks far more common than they are killed in car wrecks today. I got to the church and I testified that the Lord had preserved me and kept me that my car lost control and blah, 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 blah. And then we got down to pray. And as we got down to pray, I was sitting there praying and all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord, it was almost like God let a movie screen down in front of my eyes. And I literally saw that exit. I saw the whole round exit, the snow, the ice, my car spinning. But I saw something I didn't see when I was on the exit. Literally, I saw a wall of angels on either side of that exit. And I'm covered in goosebumps right now because I remember this like it was yesterday. I saw a wall of angels. And when my car would get close to the guardrail, the angel literally pushed it. <laughs> and I literally saw this happening. And I saw an angel push it. And then it would go spinning and it would go over there. And the angel would push it. And it would go and it would go over here and the angel would push it. And they literally basically just guided, even though it was spinning, they guided it down the exit till it got to the bottom and stopped. And I never flipped. I never hit a guardrail. Well, I won't tell you, I was so thrilled that the Lord showed me that. But just like any good person, I later had to go to that exit because I figured, you know, there might be some natural explanation. You know, I, I maybe that was just my imagination that produced this vision. Maybe it was just my imagination. I said, maybe there's a curb before you get to the guardrail so that when my tires would hit the curb, it would push it, you know, back out. So after the snow had melted and everything, I went back there. See, I didn't travel that route. The only reason I took that route that day, they had sent me to a store that I didn't normally work at, and I was taking a route to get to the church that I'd never taken before, okay? So this isn't a route I traveled regularly. So I decided a couple weeks later when the snow had melted and the roads were clear, I said, I'm going to go back up that way and I'm going to look at that exit and see. And I went and I looked and Tommy, there was nothing, nothing, nothing in front of the guardrails. There was a little bit of shoulder. There was a white line. There was no curbing. There was nothing that would stop my tires and, you know, prevent me from hitting that guardrail. Oh, I want to tell you, we're super saints today. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, folks, you don't know how many times God has intervened for you. You don't know how many times the laws of nature have not applied to you. You don't know how many times the laws of gravity haven't applied to you. I remember Brother Brock the pastor who baptized me in Jesus' name in the apostolic movement. I remember Brother Brock telling the story of his daughter when she was very small. She decided one day she was going to climb up on, they had a house that had a railing and a, and a landing at the top of the stairs, and there was a railing, and then there was a two-story fall. And he said, one day, we heard a bang. And my wife and I ran out, said we were scared out of our minds. We didn't know what on earth had happened. He said, and there was our daughter on the floor. She had climbed up. She was only, I think he said, like maybe four. You know, very, very young. Maybe five. And he said, she had climbed up over the banister for whatever reason and fell two stories. And they were terrified, of course, that she severely hurt herself and she sat up. 
And she said, don't worry, Daddy, that man caught me. They said, what man? She said, that, that man in white caught me. Now they heard a bang. She said, a man caught her. She didn't have a broken bone. She didn't have a concussion. She didn't have any sign of a fall whatsoever. She fell two stories without any injury whatsoever. I met her when she was about, I think at the time she was about 19 or 20. I met her and she told me, that happened. She said, there was a man that caught me. She said, that happened. She said, I know what happened. She said, I, and here she was 20 years later. She said, I know what happened. I was there. She said, there was a man in white that caught me. And then he let me down on the floor. Or no, you know what? They didn't hear a thud. They heard her scream is what it was when she fell. Anyway, so... I'm here to tell you folks, we as the people of God are unique. We as the people of God are here on this earth. We are here in this life with diplomatic community. There are times when the laws of nature don't apply to us. There are times when the laws of science do not apply to us. Glory to God. We represent a foreign nation. But we live here as representatives of the nation from which we come. Hallelujah. This doesn't mean that as the employee or as the representative of a foreign embassy that we're incapable of breaking a law in the nation we reside within. But because of diplomatic community, we can only be held accountable by the nation to which we belong as a legal and legitimate citizen. You see, a lot of people in the church don't understand grace. And if there's any doctrine, if there's anything that is misrepresented and mispreached, it is grace. And I'm here to tell you today, there is a difference, folks. This heaven or hell crap that you hear preached all the time, that believers somehow or another are able to step out of grace and slide into hell at every provocation, that is garbage from the pits of hell designed to make you so discouraged, designed to make you believe that it is utterly impossible to live up to God's standards, so why even try? That's what the enemy is trying to convince you of. But the reality is, as a child of God who embraces, who has obeyed the gospel, who continues to do what is necessary, to be saved. And what does the word of God say? It's necessary for a believer to be saved. Paul said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I told you last Sunday that is not the salvation plan. No, 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 no. Salvation plan is found in Acts 2.38. But that is how you maintain your place in the grace of God. Not through good works. Not through obedience to the law. You maintain your place through faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Lord said, you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. This is a caveat that you don't hear preached a whole lot anymore. But God does not permit, listen to me now, God does not permit timid, embarrassed, or ashamed saints. He said, no, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, he said, I'll be ashamed to confess you. Isn't that what he said? So he doesn't allow, you can't be embarrassed 
saint. You can't be an ashamed saint. You can't be a saint who's afraid to acknowledge you're a follower of Christ. No. Those are two requirements to walk in grace. One, you've got to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Secondly, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Now what's interesting is a lot of people read that passage and, and we I think we miss the import. I think we miss what is being said in that passage. Because a lot of people say, well wait a minute, that's, that's awful simple. If all the Lord is telling us through Paul is to, to walk in grace, all we have to do is confess and uh, profess and uh, believe in our heart the resurrection. Oh, well, I wonder why he only he, he didn't say you got to believe in the virgin birth. He didn't say you got to believe in the ascension. He didn't say you got to believe in all these different points of doctrine, did he? All he said is you got to believe that Jesus Christ was raised up by the power of God from the dead. Why? Why would Paul, why would he tell us all we got to do is profess Christ and believe in our heart the resurrection? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because if you believe in your heart the resurrection, there's a whole lot of stuff, just like a little choo-choo train that attaches itself. I've preached it before and I've preached it my whole life. Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ hinges on the resurrection of Christ. Everything hinges on the resurrection. If he was not resurrected from the dead, if he did not walk into that tomb as a spirit, enter back into the very body that had been crucified and died and, and revive. If he didn't stand up restored and healed and whole. See, this is where a lot of people make the mistake. A lot of Christians, you know, we talk about, oh, I'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. I'll know him by this. I'll know him by that. Oh, no, you won't, honey. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, no, 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 no. My God is able to heal scars. Hallelujah. Oh my God. My God is able to heal wounds. Glory to God. When you come to the Lord and you're born again and you're buried with Him in the waters of baptism and your old man dies with Him and you raise up to newness of life, I'm here to tell you now, a lot of your scars are going to be missing. A lot of your pain is going to be gone. A lot of your old bruises are no longer going to appear. A lot of your old wounds are no longer going to fester and trouble you. Hallelujah to God. Oh, I want to tell you, because God is a healer and a restorer, why do you think the apostles could not recognize him and appreciate the resurrected Christ when they saw him? Why do you think he could walk down a road with two of the disciples talking about his death? And the whole time they had no idea who they were talking to. Number one, they were convinced he was dead and buried, number one. Number two, all he had to do was have a cloak over his head, and they're not looking directly into his face. And three, even if he looked just like Jesus, even if he looked just exactly like Jesus, they saw him beaten. They saw a crown of thorns pat into his head. They saw his side ribbon with a with a spear. They saw his hands pierced. They, according to the word of God, he no longer even looked human. He looked like meat. Isn't that what the scriptures tell us? Why in the world then, if you're talking to somebody who looks normal, <laughs> Why would you think for a second it's Jesus? You're not going to, for a minute, you're not going to think it's Jesus. He had been healed. He had been restored. At the, at the point of resurrection, he came up looking like normal Jesus. Hallelujah. That's not anything they were expecting to see by a million miles. And if they did see something that appeared to be a normal Jesus, so to speak, they were thinking, my God, it's a ghost. <laughs> 
They couldn't imagine it could really be him. Why? Because he doesn't look like a, a beat up bruised piece of meat. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Everything hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe in your heart that God hath raised him up from the dead, oh honey, then guess what? you got to believe he ascended. Why? Because if he rose from the dead and he's not physically here now, he had to have done something. The Bible tells us he ascended. So if you believe God raised him from the dead, you must believe he ascended. If you believe he ascended, then you must believe in Pentecost. Hallelujah. You must believe the Holy Ghost came. You must must believe that the Spirit of Christ is still present in the world and still present in the believer. Oh, honey, I'm here to tell you today, if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, there's a whole string of things you must believe. Glory to God, because it's that one event that opens up a world of other realities. Glory to God. Woo! He doesn't need you to believe the litany of things. Because if you believe this one thing, the litany follows. Hallelujah. Oh my God, have mercy. Sin no longer has dominion over us. The law of sin in this world no longer has dominion over us. But that does not mean, listen to me now, that we will not be held accountable for sin. On his own home planet, even Superman would be subject to limitations and the laws which governed the people of his own country. On his home planet, Krypton, Superman uh, excuse me, uh, criminals were portrayed as being imprisoned and banished. You remember in that one Superman movie? It's okay. They didn't have superpowers on Krypton so that they couldn't be imprisoned and they couldn't be banished. No, it's only when he's no longer on a planet that has the same uh, gravity and the same, you know, laws of nature that he suddenly has abilities, all right? Uh, but once he gets, if he goes back to Krypton, he, he, well, he falls under the authority of those laws. Got news for you. When you get to heaven, when you stand before the Lord in the judgment, the Word of God said He will judge every man according to their works. And you know what He said? Does the Word of God not say, does the Lord not say when He returns that He will reward every man according to His works? Yes, He will. Reward, got news for you, honey. Reward and award are not the same thing. You ever seen somebody do something really nasty and really mean and somebody else, that's all right, he'll give his just reward. Doesn't mean it's good. It just means you'll get what you deserve. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That's what Jesus promised. You see, the saints... We're here with diplomatic community. Sin doesn't have the same power over us as it does the unbeliever. But that doesn't mean if you run around like some kind of a nut doing all kinds of wickedness and all kinds of evil and all kinds of ungodliness that you're not going to have to answer for that sin. Oh, honey, when you get home, you will have to answer for that sin. When you get to your own country, you will have to answer for that sin. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Because we live under a different set of laws. While on earth, people from Krypton would have supernatural powers, but on their home world, they would yet be subject to laws and limitations. Matthew 16, 27, the word of the Lord said, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man 
according to his works. 1 Corinthians 3 and 8, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. In Revelation 22 verse 12, the Lord promises, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Many Christians, preachers, denominations, and theologians fail to recognize the difference between salvation and damnation versus judgment and reward. Children of God are promised by God to be rewarded or recompensed for their conduct in this life. While they may escape the immediate condemnation of hell and, dam and damnation, they will not escape being held accountable before God. The laws of the world in which we live may not apply to us now, but the laws of our home nation do yet hold sway over us. This is why it is foolish to believe that simply because the Lord has extended His grace toward us, that we can live as the world lives and ultimately escape any accountability because after all God's grace in Romans 6 1 through 9 the Apostle Paul writes what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and henceforth, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. You see, we have diplomatic immunity. You die with Christ in the waters of baptism. You're freed from the penalty of sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. There are numerous examples in the Word of God of uh, stories and parables in which servants and sons are portrayed as being held accountable at the time of their master's return. We read about the unprofitable servant in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. But if you read specifically Matthew 25, 30 through 33, you read these words, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him. Now a few moments ago we read the Son of Man is going to come in whose glory? In the glory of the Father. Now he said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Oh my God. Put two and two together, you come up with four, folks. And all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne, the throne, the throne of his glory. And before him, not them, him, shall be gathered all nations 
and he shall separate them one from another as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left so he says when the son of man returns when the lord returns what's going to happen judgment he's going to take his people and he's going to separate the good from the bad those who have done as they ought to and those who have not done as they ought to you're not going to escape judgment you're not going to escape having to answer for your wrongdoing if you're a believer and you genuinely sincerely are serving God and living for the Lord we read about the compassionless wicked man in Matthew 25 31 through 46 but if you read specifically verses 41 through 46 Matthew 25 then shall he say unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels for I was an hungered and ye gave me no meat I was thirsty and ye gave me no drink I was a stranger and ye took me not in naked and ye clothed me not sick and in prison and ye visited me not then shall they also answer him saying Lord when saw we thee and hungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. For you JWs who don't want to believe in hell, but the righteous into life eternal. What am I saying? I'm saying... When you get to the other side, you will answer. You will be held accountable. Say, well, does that mean that I could wind up in hell anyway? Mm -hmm. What does the scripture say? Does that mean I could wind up lost anyway? What does the scripture say? The unprofitable servant was cast into outer darkness where they're sweeping and gnashing of teeth. The compassionless wicked, where are they sent to? The Word of God said they're sent into everlasting punishment. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But the righteous under life, what are righteous people who do right? What is doing right? All the things he just talked about is righteousness. We read about the servant who failed to forgive in Matthew 18, 23 through 35, but specifically verses 32 through 35. Then his Lord after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that, all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. You remember the story, the king forgave the man instead. Then the man turned around, went out and throttled another man who owed him far less than he owed the king. Word got back to the king, so the king called him back in and held him accountable for that debt. Jesus said, if we don't forgive, he said, then God will not forgive us. Isn't that what he said? So guess what, folks? When people get up and talk about forgiveness and they talk about, oh, you know, God's forgiven you and it's been cast into the sea of forgetfulness and it'll never again be remembered. No, 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 no. There's a misapplication here. There's a misreading of the word of God because according to what the Lord said here, you can you can be called in and held accountable after you've been forgiven. And if you haven't lived by the law you're under, 
because one of the laws of our home nation is forgive and it shall be forgiven isn't it if you haven't abided by the law of the nation from which you come when you get to that nation you will be held accountable for that because you're not you're immune to the laws that are subject to this world but you're not immune to the laws that God's established for the saints so in other words you have superpowers you have super abilities there are times that things in this world don't apply to you including the penalty of sin however you're still accountable to God to act right. Come on now. Does that mean you'll wind up in hell? No. No. Does that mean you'll be forever lost? No, 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 no. And you might remember a couple weeks ago while I was preaching, I made the comment that some people think in heaven everything's going to be even. Everybody's going to have the same. Oh, we're all going to have exactly the same. And I made a very bold statement. I said, that's a lie from the pit of hell. And I didn't qualify. I didn't go into detail. Well, you know what? I'm catching up on that now, okay? The Lord said He will reward every man according to His work. The Lord said that after the resurrection, He said many that are first shall be last, and many that are last shall be first in me. Oh, I want to tell you, in heaven, honey, there are going to be people who've done their best to live this thing right. And they're going to have trophies on their mantle. They're going to have stars in their crown. They're going to have blessing and reward from the Lord. And there are going to be people in heaven who have not laid up a single treasure. Didn't I say last week, didn't the Word of God say, lay up your treasure and love your side where it does them all? Well, what happens to those who haven't laid nothing up? They're going to have less, aren't they? Of course they are. There's going to be homeless in heaven. You're going to have people, the Word of God talks about in the book of Job, talks about making it by the skin of your teeth. There are going to be people who are saved and make heaven by the skin of their teeth. They're going to be in God's heaven by the grace of God. But they've done absolutely nothing to lay up treasure. They've done absolutely nothing to obey the law of God that applies to us and we will be held accountable for it when we stand before Him. What is that law? That's what I want to get into in a second and I hope I'm, I'm not, I'm going, I'm going to wind up going a little bit long today. I'm sorry. Romans 14, 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Matthew 3 and 12, the word of the Lord said, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In Luke 3, 17, it similarly says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. In Matthew 29, uh, 25, verses 29 through 33, Jesus said, For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. You lay up treasure on the other side, you do like you're supposed to do and you're not worried about building a kingdom down here on earth and being rewarded and being rich and being prosperous and having everything you can get like the prodigal son in this life you lay up treasure on the other side he said he that has going to get more you're going to be rewarded 
So while you're laying up treasure, the Lord said, honey, once you get here, I'm going to double what you got. You remember what he did for the servants he gave talents to? They doubled their money, and what did he do? He said, keep it at yours. Hallelujah. Everyone that has, he says, is going to get more. Didn't you ever wonder why it said that? Didn't you ever think about why it's worded that way? For unto everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. In Matthew 13, 24 through 30, the word of the Lord said, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? The tares, that is. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. What is the Lord saying? He's saying that when the time comes, He'll separate the good from the bad in the church. This is why we have no business setting people aside. This is why we don't ostracize people. This is why we don't refuse people access to the church. Because in the process, you're acting the jackass, trying to deny a sincere person. They, they are sincerely trying to serve the Lord and live for the Lord, whether you understand them or not, whether you like their quote-unquote lifestyle or not. The reality is you have no business trying to tear up the tears what you perceive as the tear mm -hmm. the Lord said no 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 let them grow up together I'll take care of deciding who is rewarded in what manner oh my Lord have mercy the Lord Jesus Christ was recorded by the apostles as being above the laws of nature superhuman if you please he demonstrated divine knowledge. He demonstrated divine wisdom. He demonstrated healing powers. He demonstrated authority over death. He demonstrated immunity from natural laws like gravity. He was able to walk on the water. The church is bestowed with the gifts of the Spirit so that we too are able to demonstrate powers as it were that defy science and contradict the laws of nature. And if you'll go to our Bible study this Wednesday, I'll talk, I'll be talking about the gifts of the Spirit and how they operate and what have you. So I don't I'm not going to go into some things I could go into because I'm already over time. In Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18, the Lord talks about super saints. 
And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them, not may, not might, not could, shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I took so many Tylenol that it was supposed to kill me, but it didn't. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Remember that testimony I told you about earlier about that young lady? I've seen miracles like that, honey. I've seen so many miracles like that, I can't even count them, and I'm not kidding. That, that was just one of God only knows how many miracles I've seen. I've seen God lift people out of, uh, 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 who have been paralyzed, that doctors said would never walk, and I've watched them walk down the aisle of our church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11 declares, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but all these work at that, that one and the self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. I'm talking about the supernatural. I'm talking about the powers that are demonstrated in the church that go beyond the laws of nature. That go. If you want to understand these gifts, come be with us Wednesday night, okay? I, I'm, I've gone over time, so I don't want to take time to try to expound upon all this today. As born-again children of God, it is expected that we will conduct ourselves differently than the unbelieving world. How can we not? After all the Lord has done for us. How is it possible that we should live our lives devoid of love and compassion? The greatest commandment according to the Lord. In Matthew 22, 30. 7 through 40, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I got news for you, my evangelical friend. You will answer to God for that law when you stand before the Lord in the judgment. And you will be rewarded for every hateful word you speak, for every judgmental, condemnatory, nasty comment that has ever come out of your mouth. You will answer to God in the judgment. You may possibly if God's mercy holds true for you, you may make heaven, but honey, you'll be homeless. Because you have made no preparations. You've laid nothing up on the other side. The greatest commandment for God's people is to love the Lord with all your heart. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Some will call themselves today born again children of God. Do not believe, do not behave as they ought to behave. They live as though the grace of God affords them a free pass to embrace any evil or wicked act or behavior they wish. They fail to recognize that while they preach various sins and offenses 
at others. They ignore that which the Lord himself said was the greatest commandment and the singular commandment upon which all of the law and the prophets hang. Scripture describes them as gagging at gnats and swallowing camels. They walk as one who enjoys diplomatic immunity and are subject to different laws than those under which the unbeliever lives, but they fail to understand that believers too will one day be held accountable to the higher law of God. While we may be afforded many blessings and benefits of relationship with the Lord, we also at the same time become subject to the higher law of God. Even, listen, I know I'm using fiction, I know I'm using fictional characters, but I think, you know, using these things, most people in the modern world get a better understanding. Even X-Men must answer to God. In the end, we shall receive reward payment for all deeds done in the flesh. The easiest way to assure we stand worthy of hearing the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The easiest way to make certain that we will hear those words is to walk in love, exercise compassion, practice charity, and regularly forgive. If we super saints walk by this law, then in the end, when we get home to our own country, oh hallelujah, all will be well. Praise.